Nathan, welcome. Thank you. Where are you staying here? Not in a hotel. No, I have a, a, a beautiful Airbnb uh, right on the, the Spree River. I think the neighborhood is, uh, help me out here, Galk, it's the Bel Glock, Glockenbach. I need to practice my German. That's what they call eating the dog food <laughs> in Silicon Valley. Um, so last time you issued some numbers, I think it was this time last year, you'd had a million stays over last year's New Year's Eve. Alexandra says, a couple of million listings now. Give us some new numbers. Update us on how big this network of yours is. 2015 was an incredible year for us. I mean, we really went mainstream. Uh, 70 million guests have used Airbnb to date. More than half of that was last year, meaning uh, last year, over 35 million guests used Airbnb. That is more than the previous seven years combined. Uh, today, we have about 2 million properties on the platform. And uh, on New Year's Eve, we had over a million guests in a single night. Uh, Europe is at the center of this growth story. Uh, more than half of our revenue is coming from Europe. About 57% of our properties uh, are in Europe, uh, more than a million. Uh, and in Germany, uh, we saw 600,000 uh, Germans have, have used Airbnb to travel uh, today. So just overwhelmingly uh, popular here in Europe. And how many territories are you in now? Because you just opened in Cuba recently. How big? Cuba brings the official count to 191 countries. Yeah, so we, we added Cuba earlier in 2015. Uh, we now have about 3,000 properties in Cuba. And where do you see the next level of growth? If you're going to justify a $25.5 billion reported valuation, you've got to keep growing. How do you do that? Well, it travels to such a big industry. Uh, so by all measures in comparison to the the opportunity, we're still very small. Um, and so we see a lot of growth potential in our core business. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in Asia. China is our fastest growing country for travel. Uh, we had about 700% increase in travel out of China last year, so very staggering hyper growth coming from there. Uh, we're also seeing opportunities within new categories of travel, uh, one being business travel. Uh, you think Airbnb, you probably think leisure. That is what most people do, but actually 10% are now using it for business. Uh, and we've signed up over 10,000 businesses um, into a specific business travel program that we offer uh, that makes it easier for companies to handle billing, uh, to address kind of their duty of care responsibilities for employees, um, as well as make it easier for travelers to find business-ready listings. So that's a, that's a new category. Vacation rentals is another category. Vacation rentals have obviously been around for a long time, uh, but you can find many of them on Airbnb now. Uh, and then finally, what I'll say, and this is a little bit more long term, is we're trying to think beyond just the accommodation. Our travelers are looking for a more authentic way to experience the places that they're visiting. They're looking to experience culture. Today, we do that through the home and through the host. But tomorrow, we look to do that outside of the home uh, and really play a bigger role in shaping the experience is that people have when they travel and leveraging our host community to do that. You had a big Airbnb gathering in Paris a few weeks ago. I think Brian Chesky was reported as talking about packages. I think you were calling it journeys, maybe a three-day trip to San Francisco where you get the flights and the meals and the day trips included for $500. How close is a product like Journeys to coming to launch? Well, we're, we're piloting a number of ideas right now. We haven't shared too many specifics because we still are in the kind of the piloting phase. That's why I asked so, questions. Yes, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to, to get the, the specifics. Okay. How big is the team at the moment? We have over 2,000 employees. So it's still pretty small for a company of this size. What's the challenges you've had in building that team? Whew, um, you know, when you're bringing that many new people in each year, uh, we, we hired almost 1,000 people or so last year. That's a lot of new blood. And so um, culture has always been super important to us. Before we hired our first employer, employee, we, we really defined what our core values are. Uh, and as we bring in many more people, um, it's important that we double down on our core values to maintain the strong culture. Um, you know, you also have to rethink how you do things. Um, at our scale, we have to constantly be up-leveling and making sure that we're doing fewer but bigger things uh, in order to have the kind of impact uh, that we want to be having. So you're constantly rethinking your operations uh, when you're in hyper-growth mode. And you have a challenge, I guess, between scale 
of properties available and the curation of those properties. At the very beginning, you know, you and Brian could go and photograph properties and meet the hosts. You can't really do that when you're at a couple of million. How do you ensure that level of curation of quality control? A number of things. I, first, I can't, uh, you shouldn't underestimate how important the reviews are. I mean, that, that sounds like a very simple concept, but it's so critically important because it aligns incentives. It incentivizes hosts to be incredibly upfront about what they're offering so that they attract the right kind of travelers. One of the things we've discovered is, um, who are we to say what is a good listing or not? Uh, most important is to be transparent because there's all kinds of travelers. There's travelers who uh, are looking for a couch to crash on and really want to experience the host. There are other travelers who are looking for an entire place uh, and, and actually don't want to interact with the host. And of course, everything in between. Um, so a big part of our focus has been to get our host to be incredibly transparent about what they're providing and then through the reviews, verify that that it's accurate. Um, and also encourage dialogue between guests and hosts, such that if something isn't quite right, if expectations weren't met, uh, there's a way for guests to privately give feedback to hosts if they don't want to leave a public review uh, to talk about that. Um, so through mechanisms like that, a lot of the right things uh, happen. Another incredibly successful program of ours has been the Superhost program. Superhosts are basically our top tier hosts. These are the ones who get the highest reviews um, on our platform. Uh, and so we've, we've defined a standard, and, and every quarter we reevaluate. And every quarter we've seen more and more of our hosts kind of reach that highest level. And today we have about 95,000 super hosts. And as a traveler, when you search, you can easily filter and, and, and find these, these great hosts. Yet, even if you've got 99 point whatever percent satisfaction, the tiny minority that aren't happy are not just reviewing badly, they're going to the media. And I was just looking through some of the headlines about Airbnb just from January. Vice, my wedding night was interrupted by a coke-fueled orgy in my apartment. A German tourist sues Airbnb after finding a hidden camera in her flat. Oh, the drug lab raid ruins families' Airbnb holiday. I mean, how do you cope with the growing public perception through the media that it's a risk to either borrow or rent out an Airbnb property? Yeah, we're in this stage where there's an incredible amount of interest in the company. Uh, and so anything that, that happens literally gets global coverage. Um, and particularly some of these sensational stories. I mean, these, these just go viral, literally. Um, the truth is, though, they're incredibly rare. Um, for example, on New Year's Eve, we had, um, we had a million guests uh, in a single night. And for the year, we had 35 million guests. So huge volume. All of last year, we only had 540 incidences where there was damage in excess of $1,000. So out of 35 million guests, only 540 incidences that were of any significance. That's uh, a ratio of one in 50,000 guests have any sort of issue. I think that's an incredible record. It's one that I'm very proud of. That's a number that's been getting better every single year. And it's by no accident. Um, it's because of our deep investment into trust and safety initiatives. I already spoke about the reviews. But on the back end, we have uh, very sophisticated machine learning that looks for patterns of behavior uh, and gives us early warning signs if something looks amiss so that we can address it proactively. And I think it really speaks to the power of a marketplace and how actually communities at scale can function better and promote more trust. I guess it's about keeping control of the story. So how does Airbnb get your story out there most effectively? Just in general, um, most of our growth is coming through word of mouth, to be completely honest. I wish I, I could say that our, our marketing uh, efforts uh, were responsible for all the growth last year. Um, but the truth is, uh, when people travel, they come home. Of course, they talk about their travels. Airbnb often plays kind of a pivotal role uh, in their travel story. And that's the best way to hear about Airbnb, because it does take a little bit of a leap of faith. It requires trust. And uh, you're going to trust it a lot more if you hear about it from a friend or a family member, much more so than from a commercial. Uh, so that is what's fueling the growth. And that's why our growth has been so consistent. Year after year, we've doubled. And last year was no different, uh, despite, in absolute terms, having such larger scale. Now, normally, you'd expect the business to decelerate as it gets bigger. Um, but literally, there's that many more people coming home, talking about their travel experiences, uh, and, and that's what's driving the incredible growth. 
Another challenge you have is city authorities deciding they don't want Airbnb operating as Airbnb wants to operate. I think Barcelona has been fining people 60,000 euros, Paris, San Francisco. You've had challenges in each of these cities. At some stage, the regulators are going to severely limit the growth of Airbnb, no? Well, actually, I think we, we really welcome regulation. We're asking for it. Uh, what we're asking, though, for is regulation that speaks specifically to home sharing, which is our bread and butter. Um, the issue today is that most of the existing regulation talks about short-term rentals broadly and doesn't speak specifically to home sharing. So that's the distinction we're looking for going forward. Um, you know, we're at a point now, though, where there are a number of cities that we've had a very successful partnership now with for one or two years. So, for example, Amsterdam, over two years ago, uh, passed a law specifically targeting home sharing, and it's been very successful. We've had a very good relationship with the city of Amsterdam, also with uh, France and Paris, uh, UK and London. Um, I think these are all kind of role models for how there can be a constructive relationship between a company like ours uh, and a city. Um, and I, th I hope many other cities will follow those models. Uh, the truth is that we're in 34,000 different cities. This is an issue uh, in most of those cities. Most of these rules vary city by city, or in the case of Germany, by state. There's 16 states in Germany. Hamburg was also very early to pass uh, specific home sharing policies. We welcome those. Those have been very successful. Um, but now we have to do that in, in the other 15 states. And of the 2,000 team members, how many of those are working on working to try and change regulators' strategies, lobbying? I wouldn't describe it quite like that. I, it's more uh, seeking kind of partnership. Uh, what we're finding as we talk to policymakers is there isn't really an understanding of what is fundamentally happening. And so we've gone out and we've made some public commitments to really kind of be upfront about what we're willing to do as a company. Uh, and of course, we're staffing appropriately to do that. Um, the, the things we're willing to do um, at a very minimum uh, is one, partner with cities to collect and remit the appropriate tax. Uh, we think that's just fundamental for uh, a good long-term relationship, and we're willing to help out with that. Uh, two um, is sharing data at the aggregate level and on a kind of an anonymized individual level to really help cities understand what is this new activity that's happening. Um, right now, there's not a good understanding of that by policymakers. They don't have access to the data. So they, they hear things, but they don't actually uh, see the specifics. Uh, and so we're working with them to provide that to whoever wants it. Three, um, cities that do have uh, specific concerns around their housing, uh, we're partnering with them to engage on that. We're not trying to avoid those topics. Um, so we've gone out, we've made this public commitment to any city that wants to have a conversation, and we're staffing up the team to make sure we can support all those conversations. Because again, we operate in 34,000 different cities. That's a lot. That's a lot of conversations to be happening. Uh, there's about 20 or so cities and countries that have already passed policies, but that leaves a lot of work to be done. But that also involves fairly ambitious local advertising campaign. You had a campaign in San Francisco, which I saw was reported to have cost about $8 million advertising on bus billboards. You know, dear public library, we hope you see some of the $12 million in hotel taxes that you're paying to keep the library open for later. I mean, is this going to be a significant part of the future, public campaigns of persuasion? Um, my hope is, is that it's not necessary. I mean, this, this can be a simple conversation, and it has been in many places. It was a simple conversation in France and UK where the government said, we're going to do um, a study of the situation, and then we're going to make a decision. It was a very clear process. Um, San Francisco's challenging, uh, was challenging for us. There's a lot of misinformation flying around. A lot of folks were accusing us um, or believing that we don't pay tax. And in fact, that was one of the things we did very early on with San Francisco. And today, we pay over a million dollars a month. Um, and so that was a misconception that we looked to correct. A second issue uh, is, unfortunately, politics come into this way too often. And by politics, I mean all the different stakeholders in the community that have something to be gained or lost kind of jump into this, even those outside of the community. So what we saw in San Francisco is that the campaign against us in San Francisco was being funded by hotel labor unions in New York City. They were paying for advertisements talking about affordable housing in San Francisco. I'm not sure what the relationship was, why New York's and hotel 
or caring about affordable housing in San Francisco, except to say I don't think that's what was at stake. It was something else. One of the issues, I guess, that the regulators often look to is the proportion of your customer base that are professional renters. Um, can you share any numbers on the proportion of hosts who have more than one property? So globally, 80% of the home hosts uh, rent the home in which they live, so their primary residence. Um, that does mean there is a minority of people who are renting something else, uh, and that, that runs a full spectrum. What we said with cities is we believe strongly in home sharing, that is, renting the home in which you live. Um, that is what we have uniquely pioneered. For all this other stuff that is outside of home sharing, whether it's a traditional vacation rental or otherwise, let us partner with you. Uh, you define what your policies are, and we'll work together to communicate those policies to our users. BuzzFeed, I think, did some calculations on some of the numbers um, you made available. It said in New York City, um, about 30% of the revenue came from, from hosts with more than one listing. That changes people's perception of what Airbnb is. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's an accusation that a lot of our growth is coming from uh, these folks who are renting out multiple properties. <clears throat> the truth is the percentage of revenue that's been coming from professional rentals hasn't changed over the years, and in fact is trending down in a lot of places. Uh, so that is not what's driving the growth. Um, Yes, there are a minority of professionals. Uh, it counts for slightly more than its fair share of revenue because they are professionals. And this is the conversation we want to have with cities, which is let's get really clear about what are the policies for home sharing, how does that differ from the policies for commercial, and then we can get more clear about communicating. But in the absence of policies that distinguish between home sharing, uh, it's, it's really difficult uh, to make any progress on this issue. So if you look at places like Paris, London, Amsterdam, where we do have these, these policies specific to home sharing, we've been more forcefully communicating up front what those policies are, and it's been having the right effect. The proportion coming from commercial listings has been trending down. Um, so I think it speaks to the power of collaboration, but this is an iterative process. To, to expect to be able to snap your finger and, and, and kind of change uh, you know, what people are doing in the market is unrealistic. I think we need to start with a foundation, iterate, and if we do that together, we can make a lot of progress. I guess the trouble with being the disruptor, the big new success, is there's a lot of existing organizations, companies, institutions that feel threatened, and they had things their way for quite a long time. What would you say if this was a room full of CEOs, chief financial officers of all the big hotel chains. How would you reassure them that you're actually the good guys? What we're doing uh, is not a perfect substitute for anything that has existed before. Um, what we've uniquely done is found a way to allow travelers to have a more authentic travel experience by staying in someone's home. Uh, there's trade-offs there. Uh, our strength is, is uh, you know, the personal hospitality that we can provide. It's the local experiences. Uh, but we can't necessarily offer the same amenities that a hotel can, can bring, whether that's uh, the gym or the front desk or uh, you know, the banquet halls. We should each play to our strengths. We should offer consumers more choice. By offering consumers more choice, we're going to make a bigger market. And I think that's what's in the best interest of society. Um, so I, don't, I haven't seen any hotels going out of business because of Airbnb. I don't think our success is coming at the cost of hotels. Uh, we can each play to our strengths, make the market bigger, uh, and as we know, tourism is, is set to expand rapidly um, over the coming years as well. So it's a growing pie. Last question from me. It's five years from now, January 2021. Steffi has invited us both back to update the story. Can we get that? in the diary. What are we going to be talking about in five years? How different will Airbnb be from now? Well, there's the things I mentioned before that we're, we're actively working on. Um, so expect to see a lot of progress there. Um, again, we're thinking beyond just uh, the home and the accommodation and the entire trip experience. How can we leverage this host community? How can we bring more people together? I think that's the actual, 
some of the real, maybe lasting impact, uh, what I'd hope our legacy to be, um, is making this world a smaller place um, by creating more understanding between different cultures, different nationalities, different ways of living. Um, and so, you know, I would hope that uh, five years from now, uh, we found a way to really kind of quantify the impact we're having um, by making uh, this, this hospitality more personal uh, and helping people uh, experience the, uh, the way others live. Thank you, Nathan from Airbnb. Thank you.